dissipate dissipative already stuff so ah, not this direction Is there a problem? No, 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 no. Okay. Problem is with my memory. Okay. So um, here we need the full retarded solution of the uh, wave equations for the field function HTT. And we get this uh, solution in a form of post-Newtonian series. That is, we make double post-Newtonian expansion. First, we expand the inverse D'Alembertian retarded operator in a formal post-Newtonian series. And also, we expand the source term for this equation. And this way, we obtain the sequence of uh, corrections to the leading order HTT. And these corrections in red color is what we need to compute uh, two and a half and three and a half radiative or dissipative Hamiltonians. Oh, I'm sorry. Why can you draw? Uh, why don't you need HTT six, but you need HTT seven? Because of algebra. If you look at the Hamiltonian density, which comes from the solving. Uh, constant equations, there is no HTT6 in these two Hamiltonians, that's all. Okay. There is no fundamental reason. No, no, okay. not at all. At high order, all will be mixed. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so as I have uh, explained at the end of my uh, yesterday's lecture, finally we have dissipative Hamiltonian, yes, which depends on the matter variable, variables and explicitly on time t. And this time dependence is related with the presence of this uh, freely propagating degrees of freedom of the gravitational field. So now how to compute the gravitational wave luminosity within this formalism, as I have already said also yesterday in extremely simple way, namely, if we would like to compute the change of energy of the system, we just compute this total time derivative using equations of motion. Everybody knows this. It is equal to the partial time derivative of this uh, Hamiltonian because only dissipative part of the stuff depends on the time explicitly. We have finally uh, partial time derivative of the dissipative Hamiltonian. Yes. And minus this uh, derivative is nothing but the instantaneous gravitational wave luminosity. That is the power at which the system radiates uh, gravitational waves. This is not uh, an observable. To get the observable, we need to average uh, this instantaneous gravitational wave lum luminosity over one period of the motion. And after this, we obtain already uh, the observable uh, quantity. And this, this formalism was used to derive, to derive at the leading order gravitational wave luminosity for the two-body system uh, in general elliptic-like orbits, and also the first uh, post correction to this, that is to so-called 1pn gravitational wave luminosity. Also, this formalism was used to compute the leading order spin orbit at spin 1, spin 2 dissipative Hamiltonians. Does it matter that you actually consider a situation where two bodies are getting closer to each other, so these periods change between? Yes, yes, of course. So are you integrating over the actual period? Yes, yes, and to, to make this 
uh, averaging, you need to know explicit form of equations of motion, yes? Therefore, this leading order luminosity is called Newtonian luminosity. This I explained yesterday because of using Newtonian equations of motion to make the time averaging of, of the instantaneous luminosity. You could use, uh, for example, different formalism and compute uh, this instantaneous luminosity, and then you would obtain for sure completely different looking functions. And as I said, this is very simple direct derivation of the leading order next to leading order gravitational wave luminosity together with uh, radiation um, effects on, on the orbital motion without assuming any balance equation between the local energy between the binding energy and the, the and the gravitational wave flux at, at infinity. Here are some more details of the computing leading order gravitational wave luminosity. Yes, everybody who study general relativity should be able to compute this. So this is one of the ways to do this. Uh, not a la landau Lipschitz, of course. <clears throat> so here is the more explicit form of the leading order dissipative Hamiltonian. We see that the function HTT5, which is given by this integral, is a pure function of time. So we, we, we have the first example of TT variable which behaves badly at the spatial infinity. Now you have to use the TT projection operator on this, on this integral. And because this integral is just the function of, of uh, time, in fact, this complicated operator uh, simplifies enormously. It is just up to a constant uh, algebraic symmetric trace free uh, operator. Finally, you have uh, this uh, formula that, that this uh, field function uh, HTT phi is given by the total time derivative of this object, which is given explicitly here. Now, when you plug this into the integral with Hamiltonian density, after integration, you obtain this very symmetric formula. But here, chi4 plays two roles, plays two roles, yes? Because first, it is a function of t, giving this explicit time dependence of the dissipative Hamiltonian. And the second copy of this is a function of, of matter variables. And at this moment, it is absolutely necessary to keep this distinction, because now you just differentiate this uh, Hamiltonian with respect to the time. Yes, and you obtain this formula. After making this, in fact, you must, you, 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 you can, stop distinguishing these variables be here and, 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 and here, because what is the what, what the next step is, is just the time averaging of this uh, product. So all must be expressed as explicit functions of time. Uh, so for example, we can make now the very simple thing, namely we can, after, identification of these two chi's, we can write this product as the uh, total time derivative of this term minus squared of first time derivative of chi4. Now, mm, this time derivative do not contribute to the average. Yeah, it is quite obvious because after integrating this, uh, we have the difference of the integrand at the beginning of the period of the motion and at the end of the period of the motion. So it is the same because the motion is, is, is periodic. So this is zero after averaging. And you have very nice formula, uh, which shows that really this is the 
uh, that we have the energy loss by the system. It means the luminosity, which is minus energy loss, is strictly positive quantity. And even this simple result was quite controversial in the last century. There were early papers in which instead of loss of energy, some gain of energy by two body system due to gravitational radiation was, was, was computed. But here situation is very, very clear. Okay, and now, I start the most, say, laborious part of my of my lecture, that is technicalities related to the regularization of the and computation of the Hamiltonians. So um, I will concentrate only on this conservative uh, stuff um, up to and including the fourth post-Newtonian order. So our conservative Hamiltonian is the sum of Newtonian, 1pn, 2pn, 3pn, and 4pn parts. And you see that to compute this, you have to perform regularization. And even at Newtonian level, you need to regularize UV divergences related with usage of Dirac delta sources. The same at 1pn, 2pn, and 3pn. Starting at 4 p.m., you have, instead of UV um, divergences, infrared divergences. Uh, I have already discussed them a little bit. And we know that they collaborate with symmetric in time tail contribution uh, to obtain the finite result. Uh, all regularization procedures used in this uh, computation are described in detail in this appendix of, of paper by myself and Schaefer from 2015 published in FISRFD. Okay, I should start from uh, discussing the structure of the Hamiltonian density. And in general, the Hamiltonian density um, sky H of X is, is the sum of three terms, contact terms, which are proportional to Dirac uh, distributions, field part uh, of this without uh, uh, Dirac delta distributions, and the exact divergence. And what is important that this exact divergence gives no contribution to H. And, and in fact, it, it contains many or even very many nasty on uncalculable terms. So it is extremely useful. But the point is that this splitting is not unique because you can integrate by parts in space. And by changing this DI, of course, you change uh, both contact and say field part of the Hamiltonian densities uh, of the Hamiltonian density, but H should should uh, should 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 yes, but H should remain unchanged. Moreover, there is also because we we, we are computing the Hamiltonian another trick possible, namely if you have. A structure like this, where over dot means the total time derivative, you can replace this by minus a b dot, dropping this term. Yes, so you can make, say, integration by parts in, in the time domain as well, what is uh, equivalent to performing a canonical transformation in the Hamiltonian formalism. So this is the other way of simplifying or unifying hundreds, thousands of terms. OK. As I have said, the structure of contact terms is very simple. We have some function multiplied by Dirac delta distribution. This symbol means that, uh, of course, the integrand has to be symmetric under the re relabeling of the particles. So to each uh, such term, you have to add uh, its companion 
in which one is replaced by two and two is replaced by one. Where of course one and two are, are, are labels of the of the particles. The problem is that usually this function is singular when x goes to x one, and when x goes to x two as well. Structure of field-like terms is very complicated in d dimensions, but it is quite simple in three dimensions. What is for 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 me very important for for the reasons I will explain in in a few minutes. Namely, uh, look at this. This is the most uh, general expression for the field part of the Hamiltonian density. You can find up to the and include in false post Newtonian order. So it is not complicated. This is the characteristic is uh, characteristic sum of this three uh, lengths. Moreover, you can use uh, prolate, prolate spheroidal coordinates, and if you put the particles in, in the focal points of this uh, system of coordinates, then by some not very tricky elementary geometric consideration, you can just eliminate all these uh, scalar products. So you can just by pure geometry reduced all these integrands to this form in three dimensions. OK, for many years, starting from the work of Infel and Plebanski, people try to devise some tools how to treat uh, products of singular functions by uh, Dirac distributions. The first idea was to introduce good delta functions by Infel and Plebanski. They just said that if we have something like this, we should regularize this by definition to zero. That's all. But in high order, we have more complicated stuff than this. But quite natural generalization of this concept is, is, is the concept of party fini value of function at a singular point. Let's call this singular point xa, not x0. Uh, then if we deviate from this singular point in the direction of na and by the distance ra, then we have this power-like expansion, yes, which always have finite number of terms which negative powers of, of m. And then as a regularized value of, of, of the singular function and, 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 and the point xa, we define the zeros order coefficients in this expansion uh, averaged over all directions. And then all contact integrals are evaluated using this rule. So for example, this contact integral is just from definition, regular value of the function f at its singular point xa. Very nice. Yes? So if I understand correctly, in the Infotlebanski prescription, uh, there was some cutoff by which you can, that you can divide delta by one or two or three powers of x but not necessarily by 100. Yes. And, and this is... And seems to just ignore every negative power. Yes, 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 yes. But uh, the, as I have said uh, in this uh, computations, we have always finite and not very great number of, of negative powers. Mm -hmm. At a given order. Yes, at a given order. The, high, the higher order, the more terms we have, of course. Infer and Plebanski also assumed that their prescription for the um, uh, regularization of the singular function um, but if, uh, that this pres prescription fulfills the following property, which uh, they call twiddling of products. Namely, if you have the product 
uh, of two functions, then uh, its regular value is distributive against the multiplication of the functions. And if, in fact, this 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 property is generally wrong for singular enough functions, and the problems with this property are serious already at the first post-Newtonian order. Why this property is, is very important? Okay, we have Poisson type equations with such distributional sources, yes? Before starting to solve them, we should regularize this source using the prescription uh, I just uh, defined, yes? But in the next step of the iteration, you can have both this formula and that formula. This is, say, new, fresh formula with some new singular function 10. And this is a formula which comes from the previous order. So if, if, if in the same Hamiltonian density at, at, at some fixed order, you have both this formula and that formula, then you should require that this is true. Because how to distinguish this and that? But as I have said, this is not the true for this three-dimensional prescription of taking part if any of the function at its singular point. This is the first problem. The second problem is related with the necessity to use distributional differentiation of homogeneous functions because you have to be able to reproduce the distributional sources for your functions. If you use the ordinary differential calculus, you never do, did, did it. So let's <clears throat> F, F be a function which is defined in some neighborhood of the origin, say, of R3 space. This function is positively homogeneous function of degree lambda, if for any positive number a, we have this quantity, yes? If we scale the argument by a, the value of the function is scaled by the power a, by a to the power of lambda. And if uh, we introduce the number k, which is minus lambda minus two, then if lambda is integer number, and it is not greater than minus two, it means that k is a non-negative non integer, then within the standard distribution theory, you can derive the following nice formula, which shows that this function should be differentiated uh, in such a way. First, you should differentiate it as a usual function, and then you should add this addition, which is proportional to Dirac delta eventually to uh, uh, gradients of, of Dirac delta. Here, sigma is any smooth surface which surrounds the origin. Okay. And as I said, this, this formula can be strictly derived within the standard Schwarz distribution theory. Mm. If, if, if the test function is, uh, say, non zero around uh, uh, zero, then, then you have to use some regularization, but which this reg reg regularization is well defined uh, within the distribution theory, so you can treat uh, this homogeneous function as a special kind of distribution, and all is perfectly precisely done. But the point is that <clears throat> This distributional derivative does not obey the Leibniz rule. And this is the very simple example. If you have one over R cubed, and then it, it represent this as a product of one over R and one over R squared, then you can try to apply here Leibniz rule. You have this one, this sum. And by inspection, it's easy to say that something is wrong here because on the left-hand side, using this uh, prescription, you obtain some addition to the uh, normal differentiation result, whereas on the right-hand side, there is no such additions. So we have to be very careful when differentiating 
uh, homogeneous functions, but uh, we have a lot of homogeneous functions when we use point particle sources, starting from the Newtonian potential, phi 2. This is not uh, the end of the problems, <clears throat> because if we look at the field part of the integrand, mostly we have uh, integrands which are uh, locally not integrable. <clears throat> So what to do? Uh, usually we use uh, regularization, which is nicely called risk implemented Hanamada regularization. And it has many equivalent uh, formulations. I will give you the shortest one, which is as follows. Because you have uh, integrand, which is supposed to be singular at two distinct points where the particles are located, x1 and x2, you introduce two <clears throat> regularization factors with two independent regularization scales. So S1, S2 are regularization scales. Uh, R1 is the distance from the, from the singularity number one to the field point, the same for two. And then you replace the integrand by the integrand times these two fractions. And then you study the double limit when epsilon one goes to zero and epsilon two goes to zero. You can treat epsilon one and epsilon two as complex quantities living in some complex planes. Okay, so in fact, we have all tools to perform the computations, but the result is ambiguous. And this ambiguity is related with, 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 uh, with, with, with the possibility of representing the uh, Hamiltonian density in very many different ways, which should be equivalent, but they are not. And you see, uh, <clears throat> I have to say that uh, when you compute such things, then uh, the most time is not used to obtain the result. The most time is used to check the result. And this is much more time consuming than the, the computing the first finite result. And checking is, is, is very tedious and time consuming thing, but without it, you, you are completely lost. And I have to say that uh, all errata I had to make uh, to my Results are all, are only related to 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 to, to misprints. What well, is not the case for other, say, calculators. And I have to say that even the special language was devised to say about the errors. You see, this is very tricky language. Maybe it will be useful for you. I will explain you in a minute. Yes. Uh, distribution by following block, and they're using instantaneous gravitational waves. So, is this uh, still this? Uh... No, no. Uh, many years ago, I looked at this possibility, and it seems that it would be uh, hopelessly difficult to use it. Okay, but going back to this new language, you see. <clears throat> No, no, no. I will. We have plenty of time, but please, Thais. In this limiting procedure, uh, you goes to zero from the positive real par, uh, part of epsilon. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So again, you are not risking in making errors. I see. Let Let us suppose that your result is A, and this is the wrong result. The The, the correct result is B. Then instead of saying that you make some error in your computations, you just say that, oh, I made some omission, omission. Namely, I should add to my result just <clears throat> this omitted term, and then it's all, all okay. Please believe me, this is the essence of this language. Of course, I should say that this A is small, sometimes, very small parts of the huge computation, 
which is uniquely done. But anyway, you have some nice way of, of, of telling about your errors. Okay, going back to the serious stuff. We need D dimensions to perform uniquely regularizations. Okay, we can easily use the uh, party fini recipe in, in D dimensions. So um, then regular value of the singular function at, at, at its singularity xa is given by this D dimensional D minus one dimensional surface integral. Omega D minus one is the volume of the or surface uh, of the D minus one dimensional unit sphere. Uh, very often I will also use this this notation FP of, from finite part. So S rec of XA is exactly the same as finite part at XA of S. And then we have the same recipe to regularize to, to, to regularize contact terms for source terms in, in, in the differential equations we have to solve and for contact terms say for, for the part of the Hamiltonian. And what is most important, we can argue that this twiddling product property is always fulfilled in the dimensions. Because it is not fulfilled automatically, but we can use the uh, analytic continuation arguments to all concrete examples and show that you can use this twiddling of products. This is a simple uh, 3PN related example. We have the Newtonian potential in the dimensions and uh, third pose Newtonian Hamiltonian um, contains this term with fourth power of, of phi two. So, we have this formula, yes. And no, we should look for the value of this in, of this uh, of this uh, fourth power when x goes to x1. And we can restrict in the d complex plane to such d that real part of this is smaller than two, and then we can show that it is trivially zero. Yes, and then we can prolongate this result. To the whole uh, complex D plane, including D equal three. So, in other words, in D dimensions, we have this twiddling property, and you can easily check that in three dimensions, this is not true. So, what to choose? We should choose this property, which comes from dimensional regularization. So after this, I know that I should use this version. Uh, sorry, this version. Also, there is no problem with uh, uh, differentiation of homogeneous function in D dimensions. This is a concrete uh, example. When you perform this differentiation, you obtain something like this. After contracting uh, indices i and j, you obtain the Laplacian, uh, the fundamental Lap Laplacian of this kind. This is just the d-dimensional analog of what all we know by heart. By the way, in the dimensions, there are still problems with Lorentz rule. Leibniz. Uh, with, uh, sorry, Leibniz rule. Thank you. And now there is an uh, interesting, say, um, different way of computing things. Uh, namely, you can use the so-called, you can try to use the so-called functional representation of the Dirac delta functions, yes? Um, quite useful is the so-called risk kernel because it, it, it contains only very simple power function of, of RA. And this is the strict uh, limit in the sense of distribution theory. So maybe it's a good idea to use this risk kernel, but then you should start from the constraint equations. You should replace Dirac, Dirac delta sources by risk kernels at the very beginning of the computation. 
and then solve the constraint equations perturbatively and develop the whole Positonian scheme. And at the end of the computations, one takes the limit epsilon one goes to zero plus, epsilon two goes to zero plus, and only after this one computes d goes to free limit. Then no distributional differentiations are needed because you have no homogeneous function because of, 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 of this epsilon a here. And uh, I use this at the third Positonian level. And in fact, uh, I was able to recompute using this risk kernel all dangerous term at the 3 pn. But unfortunately, at 4 pn level, it is already deadly complicated to use it. And there is also um, one interesting remark that if you would try to use this risk kernel in the three dimensions directly, this does not resolve ambiguities. Again, you have to do these computations in D dimensions. Okay, and now I should mention also about some modification of the Schwarz distribution theory. Honestly speaking, uh, it is a bit useless, uh, uh, as, at least as far as we are talking about equations of motion in general relativity, but from time to time, this is the, the this is the example that people are not reading papers which they are cited. They they cite these papers as something which help people to solve, for example, three or four pn equations of motion. This is not the case at all. And so, <clears throat> some time about this, very short. This uh, extended Hadamard uh, regularization was devised by Blanchet and Phi um, uh, and used them to compute uh, unsuccessfully <laughs> the third post-Newtonian equations of motion. Uh, the idea is that uh, we consider this cry of set of uh, functions which are smooth on R3 except for the two points at which the particles are located around which uh, they admit a power-like singular expansion. To which such function f, uh, one associates a pseudo-function pff, which is a linear form acting on functions from f. And this is the definition of this linear form, uh, where pf s1, s2 means the uh, part infinity of the integral. Again, you need to scales because you have to use two balls around two singularities and so on and so forth. I, I will not uh, go to deeply to the details. Then the Dirac delta distribution is represented by uh, pseudo function PF delta A, which, which gives you this, uh, this uh, regularized value of the, of the test function, yes? But uh, if you have the product of some function f from, from this set scry f and, and Dirac delta, then you have another uh, partifini pseudo function, uh, which uh, acts on the test function according to this formula. And already you see that there are problems because you have, again, uh, all this is developed in three dimensions. So you know that this equality is, is not true. So if you first regularize function f and then multiply it by, by, by pseudo function associated with Dirac delta, it is something different if you first multiply and then you associate to it a pseudo function. This is not the end of the story. Uh, they tried very hard to make such distributional differentiation that uh, will obey the, the Leibniz rule. And they did it non-unically, so they have some freedom in doing this. But the problem is that uh, this, this modified distributional derivative uh, differs from the Schwarz derivative we used before, yes? And this is the simple, very simple uh, result. If you uh, compute the first derivative of one over R using the Schwarz distribution, you obtain just the classical limit, uh, the classical sorry result. Whereas in this modified differentiation, you have some addition. 
with related with Dirac, Dirac delta. So this is say the real extension of the Schwarz distribution theory. And what is the problem? The problem is that uh, using this uh, new theory, equation of motion was computed up to a one constant. Not that, yes? But it was absolutely not possible to get the value of this constant. Because up to now, the only possibility to do this is to use dimensional regularization. And dimensional regularization rule uh, disagree completely with this extended Hadamard regularization. So what was did was as follows. They go back to the beginning of the computations, recompute what they computed using enhanced rule of uh, enhanced uh, Hadamard prescription by normal Hadamard prescription. They did dimensional regularization. They obtained the final result. Oof. And it is very difficult to uh, extract this information from the articles. But anyway, uh, okay, maybe I will shor shorten this. Okay, but I should say that, uh, to be honest, that uh, this enhanced uh, Hadamard regularization, when applied to smooth functions of compact support, that is the real test functions, uh, coincides with the Schwarz differentiation, but um, when one computes uh, higher order equations of motion, you have to differentiate singular functions, which are not test functions in the sense of Schwarz distribution theory. Okay, and, and this is what I already have said. But of course, I should mention, and this I said, that the, the difference was not large, but as I said, they had to recompute things without using extended Hadamard regularization. And what Blanchet Phi did inspired some mathematicians. And <clears throat> first in 2007 and then in 2013, Estrada, Fulling, Young, Estrada developed the theory of thick distributions. But unfortunately, this I checked carefully, and I think not only uh, myself, uh, this theory cannot be used to improve regularization problems uh, in the post-Newtonian two-body problem with Dirac delta sources. But I have found in some of these articles a very nice statement. So maybe I will read it, because there's a lot of stuff, but it is funny. <clears throat> It is not correct to say that the work of Laurent Rochefort justifies everything that physicists do with the Dirac delta function, because sometimes they do things they are clearly wrong. There is a spectrum of responses to this situation. The first, chosen by too many mathematicians, is to dismiss distributions as, as trustworthy, a kind of pornography that should be kept out of the hands of engineering and science students. Another, adopted by many practitioners, is to rationalize after the fact whatever interpretation of the symbol gives the right answer in the problem at hand. Sometimes this is done in blatant contradiction to interpretation adopted in other contexts. A safer approach is to regard the delta function as a heuristic device that leads rapidly the formulas whose whose concreteness must then be rigorously verified, e.g. by substituting a putative solution back into a differential equation. And this is, this is the third thing is what we are doing in, in this business, in fact. But one cannot be satisfied just with this. If distributions are unambiguously defined as linear functionals on spaces of test functions, then their properties must be unambiguous and the mathematician should determine which formulas and calculational rules are true and why, tightening up definition when necessary. Very nice statement. So maybe there is some space of for looking of for modified Dirac delta uh, distribution theory, which would uh, help in 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 treating Dirac delta distributions in general relativity. 
Okay, now some uh, nice formula looking at this uh, mm, field like part. You see that the generic form in three dimensions is this. Uh, unfortunately, the dimensional version of this integral exists in terms of double hypergeometric infinite series, which contain Apple functions, and it is completely useless. Nothing can be done with it because you have to use many thousands of such uh, integrals with different uh, exponents. But anyway, in D dimensions, you have very nice uh, six gamma formula uh, derived long ago by Ries. It is again Ries formula. And in three dimensions, I was able, uh, together with Schaefer, derive this nice formula. It looks not very nice, but anyway, it contains only the, uh, say, incomplete beta function, which can be expressed in terms of, of, of the Gauss hypergeometric function. In computer algebra system, all this is implemented nicely and carefully, so you can use it. Okay, and now I will show you how we implemented dimensional regularization in our computation. You see, it is not very uh, wise way, but I have to say that I haven't found the literature uh, any computation done in this fashion. And this computation uh, simplifies things enormously because uh, I do need to have the full d-dimensional result. My say working horse is uh, risk implemented Hadamard regularization in three dimensions and afterwards I improve it or correct it by some dimensional regularization uh, corrections. Because it is quite easy to recognize which singularities give you something different in the dimensions. You know the answer. This is just logarithmic, uh, logarithmic uh, singularities, one over r cube in three dimensions. If you have one over r2, it is integrable. One over r4, uh, one over r5, there is no point to use dimensional regularization because after uh, making the limit d goes to three, obtain the finite result, which is exactly the same as in three dimensions. So what to do? You should identify all logarithmic sing singularities in your computation, yes? So, <clears throat> We so we have say some integrand which develops only local poles, so so there is no problem at spatial infinity. Uh, and the result of this procedure, yes, is as follows: you have some finite part, and then you have poles in one over epsilon and one over epsilon two. Uh, let us recall that s one and s two are. Uh, arbitrary UV regularization scales. Okay, then I identify that all these terms comes exactly from this type of um, expansion term of the integrand around the singularity. It means that, look, if I now take some ball concentrated on, on singularity with the radius L1 from this term. Here R2 over S2 is not necessary because uh, it, is, it, is, it is smooth uh, at X1 and, and perform this integral. I recover exactly this part of the uh, integral over the whole space. The same, of course, I can do with uh, X2 singularity. So it is enough, take this integral over the ball and replace it by its d-dimensional version. That's all. Of course, for this, you have to know the d-dimensional version of the integral, but there is no need to make the integration of the whole stuff in the uh, d-dimensional space. And again, you can identify that uh, the term which is problematic is the term which, which is uh, of, of, of this form. Yes, 
So if you take again the ball, now in D dimensions uh, from this part, you obtain some poles in one of epsilon. Epsilon is D minus three. And of course, here you have the uh, length scale related with the dimensional regularization. So as I said at the beginning of the stuff, before the, doing this, you have to recover uh, uh, gravitational constant in the dimensions. That's all. And you see what then you do. You just take this whole three-dimensional integral, subtract from this these integrals over small balls around, in, around uh, uh, singularities, and replace them by d-dimensional versions. And then the result is f if all computations were fully done in d dimensions, fully. There is no difference. But for example, in effective one body approach, when you compute the Feynman diagram, you have to know the so-called master integrals. And we computed 4 p.n. much before the people from the effective theory because they needed one new master integral. They, they wondered very much why we finished without knowing this new d-dimensional master integrals, because we did this. OK, but for, for, for this, we need the tool to obtain the d-dimensional behavior of different functions around the singularity. Yes. So again, these functions uh, uh, are solutions of some Poisson-like equations. Uh, some of them is are uh, quite complicated. And uh, again, even if there are some formal solutions in the dimensions, usually they are useless because they are too complicated. And again, we devised a very simple recipe to do this. And also, I haven't found in the literature uh, any example of, of, of using this. Namely, here we must uh, um, extract uh, the behavior of the non-homogeneous part of the solution and the homogeneous part of, of, of the solution. Yeah? Because maybe there is some part such the Laplacian of this is zero, and uh, which contributes to the physically valid solution. So the first, <clears throat> the first stage is just take the source term and expand this around the singularity. After expansion, you have, uh, you see terms which are some combinations of units by very simple power of R1. And then using inverse Laplacians, elementary inverse Laplacians, you can quite easily compute uh, the, the, the series which, which recover the source term, term by term in, in the post-Newtonian expansion, in this power-like expansion. This, it has nothing to do with post-Newtonian stuff. Uh, uh, OK. But this is not enough. Then <clears throat> we write the formal solution of the Poisson equation in the form of the integral with the um, uh, inverse Laplacian kernel, yes. And here we expand in, in power series around the singularity, the kernel and integrate this term by term. You can check that you obtain then the homogeneous part of the solution. And then you add these two, and you have the full behavior of the d-dimensional function around the singularity. It is not very easy sometimes <laughs> to get. But again, this is something uh, much easier than, than to try to, 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 to find the full integral in d-dimensions. OK, now will be the nasty three-dimensional three example. In the previous calculation, you're using some uh, series expansion. Uh, could, you, could it happen that you'd get a constant term? Because, yes. And then you don't have a problem with inversing the Laplacian? Yes. It, it, if I well understood you. Uh, Yes, it can be. 
for example, you can get only the homo homogeneous part, yes? Uh, no, I meant if there is a possibility that because you're doing this expansion for for the source, yes. that you would find a, a constant term in source. That it, that would be, and then you formally couldn't uh, inverse the Laplace. Mm -hmm. Truly speaking, I don't know. Uh, I haven't remembered. I have uh, not remembered any problems with this, so I don't know. Maybe in general it is possible because you see, uh, what is important is just whether it is doable for all functions you have to work out. Mm -hmm. And this is the example, and after this example, we make some short break, okay? Ah, very nasty example. And this example show you in three dimensions uh, that using the um, distributional differentiation is also necessary to keep consistency in your computations. Look at this real life exam that is the integrals like this really do appear in the computations of equations of motion so it is nasty uh, divergent both at r1 uh, at x1 and x2 but we can uh, regularize this integral in two different ways the first way with the simpler one is the following you can replace this differentiation with respect to the field uh, coordinate by the differentiation with respect to the coordinate of the position vector of the particle because obviously these two differentiations differ only by by sign after doing this you can shift this differentiation before the integral sign then you use the Ries formula for this divergent integral, the, the, the result is finite. If not, then you should be very careful. But here, the result is finite. And then after trivial algebra, you have the result. By the way, uh, in the past, maybe for, for you it is not, uh, not, not strange, but in the past, uh, I met the objection that here we see that the integral is, is, is manifestly positive, whereas its regularized value is, is negative. It's perfectly good, you see. We know from the measure theory that any number plus plus infinity equals to plus infinity, well, whatever the, the, the sign of the finite number is. So if you extract from plus infinity some finite part, you should not expect that it will be positive or negative. OK. Then the second way is just perform first differentiation not making this trick with replacing differentiation with respect to the field point by the differentiation with respect to the coordinates of the position of the particle. And then you have to use this distributional rule. So you have, after doing this, you have two pieces. The first one is the volume integral. The second one is the contact type integral. Contact type integral is, 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 is here trivial because R2 is, of course, finite at x equal to x1. And this volume integral, you can also compute using the Ries formula, yeah, because this numerator is constant, so you can obtain very easy the result. And this result is different from the previous one. Only after adding these two, you obtain the same. Okay, so let's make the, the break. Five minutes. We regularize. In fact, up to 2p in order, dimensional regularization corrections are not needed. The first order in which you have uh, to use dimensional regularization correction is the third positive order. And at this order, the situation is very elegant, namely when you
when you uh, add all the R corrections together, you obtain that uh, there are many intermediate uh, pole parts, that is the terms uh, proportional to one over D minus three, but they all uh, algebraic, uh, algebraically cancel. So the correction is just a number plus the rest, which is of course not important because it, it vanish it vanishes when uh, epsilon go to zero. So here situation is very, very clear. At 4 pn level, situation is more complicated. First of all, we have to split, as I have said already, the integrand into the UV uh, divergent by infrared convergent part. And for this, uh, the total dimensional regularization correction already develop poles. And as usual, you have also the logarithm uh, with the dr length scale, L0. But you can uh, remove this uh, by the following unique, unique way. Namely, you find unique two functions, d1 and d2, this is a misprint, such that after adding the total time derivative of this combination, you cancel both C2 and C3 terms. In other words, you can absorb these singularities into a total time derivative, uh, and this can be dropped because of the Hamiltonian we are computing. And again, after obtaining this result, there is unique Theorem of this type. So we are done with UV uh, regularization. And, and so because uh, previously, I think there were two uh, UV regulators, right? These two V, these two UV regulators were in the three dimensions. Okay. By after making the trick with replacing. Uh, the, the, the integrals over the balls in, in three dimensions by d-dimensional versions of them, they disappear from the game. Okay. As I said, the result is as if all would be given, all computation would be would be done in, in, in d-dimensions. Okay, infrared divergences are much more tough. At the moment we, 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 we completed 4 pn computation, we had at our disposal only um, three-dimensional version of the tail contribution. Uh, I have shown this, this, this uh, contribution in the Hamiltonian form in my previous uh, lecture. Uh, so we had to try devise some, some way of uh, computing uh, which give you the reasonable three-dimensional limit, yes? In fact, we try to do this in D dimensions as well, because this trick with uh, making the local improvements of the three-dimensional results can be done also for infinity, yes? You can make exactly the same story by expanding the integrand around R equal to R going to infinity. But then, uh, as I said, we had at our disposal only three-dimensional version of the tail contribution. And this d-dimensional computation uh, gave some poles. And it was not possible to remove these poles by adding total time derivative. So it was not a good way to, 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 to resolve infrared uh, singularities. Therefore, we devised some new tools, in fact, two different tools. Namely, we have observed that uh, all terms which generate uh, infrared divergences are, are exactly of this type. So the real devil is this inverse Laplacian of the second time derivative of the this leading order TT function. And also, as usual, uh, 
in d dimension we have this type of singularity also logarithmic divergences in three dimensions but now in the limit when r goes to infinity to make the regularization we had to introduce a new regularization scale s and this scale was also necessary from this point of view that this three dimensional tail result depends on some scale yeah this is not physical we have to uh, have the final result which uh, does not depend on any scale. So we shortly understood that we need the scale uh, which will enter our formalism in such a way that we will have cancellation of the scale coming from the tail contribution. There was the only chance. Okay, so we, we introduced this scale, S, and now you see there are two, two things. In fact, for the consistency with, with what we did uh, for UV divergences, we developed these uh, this, uh, regularizations in D dimensions, but it is uh, meaningless because the result is as if the same story will be performed in three dimensions. Here, there is no difference between three dimensional and D dimensional regularization. But anyway, uh, the idea is that First, you artificially introduce the modification of this uh, source term for the inverse Laplacian by, by putting here the regularization factor. And then after performing uh, integrations, you, you take the finite part of the pole in the dimensions, not an epsilon, but an, an epsilon equal to zero, but at B equal to uh, two times uh, epsilon, because this B, shifts the poles for, from from uh, d equal to three to to another place in the in the complex plane the second uh, this is quite arbitrary choice although in 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 the gravitational wave luminosity computations very similar stuff is used and there it gives unique results also in three dimensions so it was not very surprising that we we, we try to do this but to check whether this is uh, reliable, we also used another quite obvious way, namely the d-dimensional version of the re-implemented Hadamard regularization. We use here R1 and R2 instead of just of R because of uh, simplifying uh, computations. It is easier to, to deal with these two factors instead of this one factor. And then we, we just multiply this integrand by these two factors, which depend, again, I should stress this, on one infrared uh, scale. And after performing the integration, we take again the finite part of the pole, which again in, in the D space is, is, is shifted from D equal to three to, to another place because of these two. Uh, new exponents. OK, and unfortunately, or fortunately, the result of these two regularization was, uh, uh, were different. But the difference was very peculiar, you see. Uh, namely, both results of the regularization of infrared terms uh, you could express in terms of some unknown constant C. That is, for one regularization, you have one value of C, and the second regularization, you get another value of C. And here is what yesterday I talked with, with Professor Ashtekar, namely that this, this constant can be interpreted as related to the arbitrariness of this infrared regularization scale. Because this term, logarithm of R12 over S, S plus C, uh, let us take this term and let us change the scale S by, by some S prime scale, uh, which is factor e to minus lambda multiplied by S. Then it is immediate to see that it is equivalent to replacing C by C prime equal to C plus lambda. So it is the same to say that we uh, modify the, the, the constant by adding some 
new constant or we rescale the infrared regularization scale. But of course, uh, all this uh, has sense only provided that we will obtain the cancellation of the scale S. And this is the case. This is the case. So now let us collect all the results. So we have the UV regularized near zone uh, infrared convergent part. We have uh, infrared regularized uh, near zone part, which depends on the scale S and on this unknown constant C. And we have the tail part, which depends on the uh, constant C. After adding all of this, we have something like this. And you see that uh, it is not very difficult uh, using the definition of this uh, Partifini operator with the scale 2s over c, um, uh, extract from this formula the dependence on, on, on the scale. It is exactly related with this term. The rest, these dots, does not depend on s at all. And you see that after adding this term to that term, we have perfect cancellation of S. Finally, we obtain this, this formula for the fourth pose Newtonian Hamiltonian. You see that here, instead of the unknown scale S, we have just the distance between the body. So this is perfectly unique term, no ambiguity here, but we still here we still have this constant C. So in that sense, we have no dependence on the scale S, but we know that uh, say C is associated with the possibility of changing of the scale. And to get this last missing coefficient, we use some uh, beyond near zone information, that is the information obtained within the self-force gravitational approach to two-body problem. Uh, namely, mm, very useful, and I will talk more about, about this in, in a moment, are formulae related to two-body problem which are gauge invariant. Yes? Because when you look at the equations of motion which comes, which come from our Hamiltonian and you compare this with the uh, equations of motion obtained in harmonic coordinates are completely different. Coefficients are completely different. Of course, you can find very carefully, it is possible, just the transformation between the two uh, equations of motion, but it is easier and more elegant just to compute from the equations of motion some uh, gauge independent formulae and check whether they agree. This is, say, the way of doing uh, things. One of these formulae is energy, binding energy of the two-body system, expressed as a function of, of uh, angular momentum, reduced angular momentum, rescaled. Uh, e is just uh, numerical value of the Hamiltonian minus the rest mass contribution. And this formula is gauge invariant, so uh, we can, in Hamiltonian formalism, we can easily compute this. And then this formula will contain the one coefficient, the unknown C. And this unknown C is a coefficient which is at 4 pn level in this part of the stuff. And it's linear in nu. You remember that the nu is a symmetric mass ratio. And this is a parameter which is also used in self-false theory. Uh, this is the first correction to the geodesic motion of the point particle in the fixed space space time yes so when you take the new linear in new information from the self false gravitational theory you can compute also the small part of this formula at 4 pn and compare with ours that's all and from this you can extract the value of c and this way we finish the the job okay before i will show you the hamiltonian Uh, let me mention that uh, uh, very soon the dimensional version of the tidal contribution were, were uh, derived. 
and uh, they were su in the success, uh, successfully used in, in, in other computations of the equations of motion at 4 pn level. So now there exist three more derivations of the 4 pn equations of motion. In all three derivations, Dirac delta sources were employed. In all three derivations, dimensional regularization were used. Two of them are effective field theory derivations, that is computation of, of dia Feynman diagrams by computer, of course. Uh, and in these new derivations, only one length scale related to the DR was enough, yes? And then, of course, we try to use this formulae from, 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 in the dimensions for the uh, tail interaction we, we we use it, and the situation is a bit, bit strange because we got the cancellation of our infrared poles, but the, but the finite part was wrong. It seems that uh, all these formulae are inconsistent with our Hamiltonian approach. It is not clear why. It is one of the open issues. But anyway, we completed first and without any error. So this is, oh, I removed all sub subsections. Oh, sorry. What can we know? I have jumped to much earlier. Maybe you have it in or I don't know. You see, something is very strange. It is blocked. Let us perhaps let us try to remember to just check it. Now I should uh, went to the sub, to the next subsection, but not sub subsection. Maybe I should try this. Oh, oh wait, no, but wait, wait, wait. Yeah, we saw this one already. Okay, it works now. Sorry. You see, some bad energy is circling me. I don't know what is going on. OK, so <clears throat> I will show the explicit formula for the uh, 2.1 ADM conservative uh, Hamiltonian uh, accurate to the fourth Positonian order, including uh, this order. So it can be. Represented as the sum of the local part, which is just a function of the canonical position and momenta of the particles, and as non-local part. Yes, and this non-local part is just the tail-related part already discussed by us. The conservative part consists of rest mass contribution, Newtonian Hamiltonian, 1 pn Hamiltonian, 2 pn, 3 pn, and 4 pn pieces. Yes, and here we have Newtonian stuff. I, I display, in fact, uh, almost half of the terms because of this one to two additions, as, as you see. Then we have 1 pn stuff, 2 pn Hamiltonian, the third pn Hamiltonian, and the fourth pn Hamiltonian. And you see, and now you can, uh, for example, you can write the usual equations of motion for the Hamiltonian, yes. You can take uh, equally complicated equations in harmonic coordinates, which are typically solved to the, uh, for the accelerations. They look completely different. And then you will, unique, you will find a unique transformation with, between them. The same is done for the result achieved by effective field theory groups. 
So you see, looking at this, it is very impressive that this is uh, compatible with three different, completely different derivations. But in, 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 in all three, they used harmonic coordinates, but we uh, do not use harmonic coordinates. You know that we use ADMTT coordinates. But there is another very powerful check of this nice stuff, namely one carré in the variance. Again, something is wrong. What is going on? Maybe I will try it from the keyboard. No. You see, I am jumping back. I don't know why. Yes. Thanks. Maybe I should show you show you slides several times because as a philosopher said, what is words to say once, it is words to say twice. I don't know. No, we, here we have. No, but you see, okay, but uh, yeah. it jumps to the previous. Mm. What is going on here? Is it correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, two body system, as far as we are. Uh, uh, consider only the conservative part of uh, its dynamics is an isolated system. And as such, and it lives in an asymptotically flat space time. And as such, it should admit one carry group symmetry. How this symmetry is realized in, in this case? I think that this is some remnants of the sub subsections, maybe. And believe me, I I I use control finds to, to remove all the sub subsections. So okay. And here the situation is not clear because uh, we used formalism, which is not uh, manifestly Poincaré invariant. It, it splits at the very beginning space times into time and space. So how to implement the Poincaré symmetry in the Hamiltonian formalism? It is quite easy. Namely, we have usual generators of the Poincaré group. Uh, for momentum and, and, and the tensor J. And we require that there exist functions on the extended phase space of the two-body system whose Poincaré algebra is realized by means of the usual Poisson brackets recipe. Yes, so which each component of this four vector and this 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 to tensor, we should associate a function on the phase space of the two-body system. This is the standard uh, commutation relation for the Poincaré algebra, in which the commutator is, again, just the usual Poisson bracket. And then we decompose uh, P mu and J mu nu in an usual way. So the time component time translation generator is just the Hamiltonian, but it should include the rest mass contribution. It is very important. It is the real energy, the total real energy. PI is just the spatial free uh, total momentum of the system. Then we have uh, angular momentum and the boost vector. 
yes, which represents the constant of motion related with the center of mass theorem, which states in Newtonian physics that you know from the grammar school that the center of mass is moving uh, along the straight line in uniform motion. And then one decomposes uh, the vector into uh, center of mass or center of energy vector G and the part uh, proportional to, to, to total uh, momentum. And of course, because of this, this form, the, the, the time derivative of K i is also zero. Okay, we can uh, now rewrite this uh, all Poincaré algebra relations in terms of this of these new quantities. And we, re we, re we re require that this re relation should be fulfilled, but within 4 pn accuracy, because different parts of the of this uh, of this uh, Poisson bracket relations will depend on different post-Newtonian orders of the Hamiltonian and maybe of other quantities. Okay, now we know that <clears throat> as a Hamiltonian, we take the full 4pn um, uh, conservative, of course, Hamiltonian. Uh, again, total mass contribution, Newton, Newton 1pn, 2pn, 3pn, 4pn local. And we can uh, forget about the, this non-local part, because as you see, you remember that uh, triple i j triple dot i j is the third time derivative of the Newtonian uh, quadrupolar moment using the Newtonian equations of motion. You can show that the form of this is uh, manifestly Galileo invariant. Yes, because we have here only x one n with x one minus x two. And we have the relative velocity. It is P1 divided by M1 and minus P2 divided by M2 in, 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 uh, in our formalism. So uh, it automatically fulfills at the 4pn level all Poisson bracket relations. OK, so we can forget it. Then we observe that Hamiltonian is Trans, translationally and rotationally invariant. It is obvious because it is built up from, from uh, scalar products and, and modulus of the, of the distances between the bodies. It means that the generators of, of linear momenta and angular momenta have exactly Newtonian-like form to all post-Newtonian orders. This is a great simplification of the ADM formalism. This is not true, for example, in a harmonic uh, coordinates. Then the formulae for um, linear momenta and angular momenta both have their post-Newtonian expansions. Here we have just this one. It means that many of these formulae, or many of these Poisson bracket relations are, 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 are satisfied exactly by this form of functions, of course. There is nothing to be checked. And after careful inspection, we see that only three relations uh, are of interest to us. So we can say that uh, the condition for full Poincaré invariance boils down to the existence of the vector G, because the rest we already explicitly know. We know Pi, Ji, and H, such that these three non-trivial relations will be satisfied. In fact, there is only there is still one more relation, but again, one can check that if uh, one constructs G only uh, from X, A, and P, and it, it is a free vector, this will be also automatically fulfilled, independently of the coefficients which are involved in G. Okay, so what, are, what we are doing now, we use the methods of undetermined coefficients. So we uh, write the most general template for the G, the most general one. Uh, of course, it has some, it has its uh, post-Newtonian expansion, uh, but anyway, the most general uh, G in, in the phase space of two-body uh, system has to be a linear combination of the positions and momentum. 
we have no more at our disposal. Yes. And the coefficient Na and Na have their post-Newtonian expansion. Here we see the Newtonian part. Yes, then we have 1 pn, 2 pn, 3 pn, 4 pn corrections. Na starts at 2 pn only. Okay. Uh, to write the most general uh, uh, template, we can make this in the following way. We can start from Newton. We know the, the, the value of G for the Newtonian dynamics. Then we can write the most general template for the 1 pn center of mass vector, find the coefficients. Then we can use it at 2 pn level. Then we write the 2 pn level template, check whether there exists such a vector which fulfill all the uh, Poisson bracket relations, and so on. At each level, we obtain the unique result. The unique result. And please believe me, try randomly check any term in the Hamiltonian, you will obtain zero solutions for the G. But of course, to write the more general expression for the uh, for the uh, coefficients MA and NA, we use this form of monomials. Look that we have nothing more uh, at our disposal. It is it is just convenient to to use in fact the velocities uh, here. This is because this is why we are dividing uh, linear momenta by, by, by masses which are so associated with with them. So the most general form is just the sum of this type monomials with some non-negative numbers n0, n1, and, and so on. And the coefficients cn are what we should find. There are just dimensional these numbers. And to constrain this uh, possible monomials, we, of course, use the mm -hmm. dimensional analysis, also Euclidean covariance, including parity symmetry. Yes, is if x is changed to minus x, we expect that the true vector will also change its uh, direction. Uh, time reversal symmetry, uh, which imposes that uh, coefficient ma, this coefficient of xa is even, and and a is odd under the operation of changing the uh, direction of the linear momentum or the direction of the uh, time flow. And of course, also we can use the uh, uh, relabeling symmetry. Okay. And for example, at 4 pn level, when you very carefully did all these things, you obtain uh, the nice template for the 4 pn level. Uh, center of mass vector G, which will contain 210 coefficients. I use Mathematica, so don't worry. I mean, uh, computer software system Mathematica. <clears throat> and to find all these 210 coefficients, it is enough just use one of these of this three uh, Poisson brackets relation. And when you do it, you obtain the 525 equations to be satisfied by the coefficient cn. So the system is overdetermined, greatly overdetermined. But anyway, one finds in seconds, using Mathematica, unique solution to it. And this is a very powerful check that this Hamiltonian is a physical Hamiltonian, which really respects the Poincaré invariance. And this is copy and accurate center of mass vector G up to 4 pn level. This is the Newtonian stuff, you see. It's very painful to, to put these equations in the article. OK. Now, uh, uh, I will shortly explain the um, 
derivation of, of the so-called Delaunay Hamiltonian because it is something very important for the establishing effective one body approach. And uh, not, con not to complicate things at this moment, I will restrict uh, myself to the uh, third post-Newtonian accurate uh, level. So <clears throat> this is the stuff which is very well known for astronomers. For example, uh, in the textbook on classical mechanics, on, class in class uh, on classical celestial mechanics, you will obtain all the tools needed to, to, to do such uh, computations. Uh, so for them, it is, it is quite a usual thing, at least for, for, for astronomers who are somehow interested in, in, in the theoretical astronomy. Okay, so, so here we, we consider the relative motion in the center of mass frame. And again, what is clear after what I have said about the Poincaré and the variance of the Hamiltonian dynamics, the center of mass frame at any PN order is defined by this very simple uh, requirement, just the sum of the momenta is zero, like in the Newtonian physics. Then we can, of course, replace the two-body problem by one-body problem. Uh, that is the problem of relative motion of the two bodies, where R is the uh, relative distance uh, between the bodies. Uh, P is, uh, represents the, 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 the momenta of the bodies. It is also useful to rescale the, the, the time in, in the way given here. Now, to be again precise, we should uh, drop the rest mass contribution for the Hamiltonian. And this headed uh, value means here just division by the reduced mass of the, of the system. Okay. So we can just replace this two body Hamiltonian by the Hamiltonian describing the relative motion of the, of the bodies. Yes, which depends on only on two vectorial quantities. This is the Newtonian uh, form of this Hamiltonian. And as I have already mentioned, this form is gauge dependent. So you can, for example, take the harmonic coordinate equations of motion. You can first, uh, this is easier, uh, compute the Lagrangian for these equations of motion. And so the Lagrangian in a usual way, you can compute the Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian will be completely different starting at 2 p.n. level, because 1 p.n. coordinate and uh, at 1 p.n. level, uh, harmonic coordinates coincide with the ADMTT coordinates. But this is a te technical issue. OK, now we again observe that uh, because of this form of dependence of the Hamiltonian on, on, on R and P, it is, of course, uh, invariant under time translations and spatial rotations. So uh, it means that energy, the numerical value of the Hamiltonian and the total uh, angular momentum of the system are both conserved. Yes, so we have the energy, E hat, because H is hatted, and we have again reduced uh, total angular momentum. It is really the total angular momentum you can check, but this is uh, quite obvious, I think. Then we use the Hamilton Jacobi theory to describe the motion of the of the two, two body system. So we also restrict ourselves to the uh, plane of the relative trajectory because of the conservation of angular momentum. Of course, the, the motion is planar. Sorry. Is there a specific reason to choose the Hamilton Jacobi over other? It is beautiful and it, it will lead very fast to the Delone Hamiltonian, you see. <laughs> you see, <laughs> this is the reason I think. Of course, uh, because the Delone variables are, 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 are example of so-called action angle variables. And in astronomy, there are very many different action angle variables. So if you don't like, for some reasons, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, I think that you can obtain this not using it. It is also possible. But anyway, uh, so we use polar coordinates uh, R phi in, in the plane of the relative trajectory. Then we have the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, where S hat is the reduced uh, uh, action integral. Yes, 
and because of the conservation of the energy and uh, momentum, we can of course factor out the dependence on the t and and phi variables. The rest is 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 of this form, and traditionally R is called the effective radial potential because it describes the the radial movement of of, of the of the two body system. Okay. Then. Mm, we need the explicit formula for this radial potential. And it is also done in, in, in a standard way. Namely, we introduce the radial component of the, of the linear momenta. Yes, and then we replace also P squared by, by means of this well-known formula. So the whole Hamiltonian after this operation is the function of R, P, R squared, and, and J squared, to be precise. And uh, R is nothing uh, but just the P, R squared as a function of the radial coordinate and the constant quantities E and J. So we must solve this, and this can be done only perturbatively, again, when we use the... Uh, for small edge, the Positonian uh, Hamiltonian. The results after uh, already given in the Positonian form is given here. This is the result valid uh, at the first Positonian order. So we see that this effective radial potential is the polynomial of the seventh order in, in the universe of the radial coordinate. A, B, C are already start at the Newtonian order, but here at 3 p.m. they contain also additions from, from higher order levels. Whereas this D, I, D2, and so on terms uh, are related with post-Newtonian corrections only. All this A, B, C, and, and so on uh, coefficients uh, depends on E and J squared. Okay, and now we know that we can uh, introduce the radial action integral, which is just the uh, integral from the square root of this radial uh, potential R. And this integral is computed from the minimum and the maximum value of the radial coordinate um, computed during the one orbit of the, of the body. So for example, from the periastron to the apoastron, using the astronomical nomenclature. And you know that uh, there is a nice theory, usually related to the name of Sommerfeld. To compute such integrals, you can uh, use residue theorems or, or funny uh, trigonometric uh, parameterization. Then you don't need residue theorem, but you have some uh, poles. So you must regularize this a little bit. Anyway. It is possible to compute this, this uh, exactly. This is just the Newtonian result. And there are this, this quantity, this uh, mm, radial action integral are very useful because two most important and observable effect, that is the periastron to periastron period. Yes, so we imagine that we have elliptic-like motion, which is not the motion along the uh, one ellipse, but it is of rosette type. The motion is, the ellipse is precessing in space. And the second quantity is just the uh, periastron advance per orbit. It is usually defined as phi minus two pi, uh, where phi is the change of the angle phi between the two consecutive periastrons, yes? And then just by um, differentiating this uh, radial action integral with respect to energy on uh, angular momentum, you obtain these two effects. Again, these are Newtonian terms. Yes, you, this is what is uh, what is uh, what is equivalent to the third Kepler's law. And of course, for the Newtonian uh, theory, we have no periastron advance. And then there are Delaunay variables. Um, Delaunay var variables have has uh, has some uh, close association to the me quantum mechanics. In fact, using uh, Delaunay variables, this kind, because there are also different Delaunay variables, uh, 
give you Hamiltonian, which is written in, in, in uh, say, quantum mechanical-like form. Yes. So we have uh, three um, Delaunay variables. J is just the angular momentum again. Jz is its z component. Um, and n is given by this sum. And in the quantum language, n is the principal quantum number. J is the total angular momentum quantum number. Uh, and Jz would be the magnetic quantum number. It does not enter our Hamiltonian because uh, he is rotational symmetric. Yes. And all these uh, are adiabatic invariants of the dynamics. And as such, in the, say, old theory of quanta, they are quantized uh, approximately in integers. This is important because this was, uh, this, say, called uh, this associations were important for the devising of the effective one body formula, uh, effective one, uh, one, one body approach. So we are almost close. Uh, we, we are close to the end, namely to obtain the Delaunay Hamiltonian, that is the Hamiltonian expressed by Delaunay variables. We take the definition of, of, of principal quantum number uh, here, and then we have to perturbatively solve this formula with respect to E. That's all. And this is the result. This is uh, third post Newtonian accurate two point mass Delona Hamiltonian. And as I said, this is a gauge invariant formula. Yes. So if you start in harmonic coordinates and you would like to uh, obtain uh, Hamiltonian as a function of Delona variables, you have to get exactly this numbers as coefficients. And you see the Newtonian, Hamiltonian is minus one over two n squared. So all we remember the Bohr formula for energy of the uh, hydrogen atom. And finally, you can uh, also um, compute these two most important observables, that is uh, the radial, the radial uh, um, angular frequency that is 2p over the period and the periastron shift per one orbit as simple uh, differentiation of this Delona Hamiltonian. And you see here uh, it is evident that uh, these functions can be uh, gauge uh, uh, independent because, because uh, due to differentiation of these functions with respect to n and j, you obtain real observables, yes? By radioastronomical observations of the double pulsar, you just measure both of these. So no doubt, these functions can be unique. Okay, I think this is a good, yes, the good moment to, to stop. Thank you.